All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Yuan Ching Wang in uh, Cadera Lab in uh, Ronson Cancer Cancer Center in New York City. And today, I'm, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to share a little bit of uh, findings and understandings we discovered in this uh, little project, GraphNets for Learning Molecular Physics. So this work is done jointly by me, Josh Fass, Ty Ster, and uh, John Gadara in, in this group. And we also got a little help from uh, my very, very good friend, Quinn Luo, in a small startup, com a startup company in Shenzhen, China. So uh, just to give you a very short introduction in case you are really, really busy. So GraphNet is a network that operates on the topological space of molecules and consists of three update and three aggregation functions. So this, net, uh, this network structure is capable of predicting per molecule, per atom, and per bond attributes, and also force field parameters. Maybe you're interested in that. So let's start with a brief introduction of what is graph and what is graph net. So here we define a graph as a, a set of sets. So it is a set of the sets of edges, vertices, or, or nodes, because vertices is such a uh, awkward word to say, and universal attributes, which is sort of the master node, the node that you put on the graph as a, 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 as a whole entity. So for proteins and molecules, we model the, them as undirected node edge and graph attributed unlabeled graphs. So here, it has to be undirected because chemical bonds has a symmetry, it has a mirror symmetry. So it cannot be directed uh, with maybe few exceptions. If you, I guess you can model some kind of complex bonds as directed bonds, but most in, in generally speaking, we, for a, a simple graph, we model them as undirected graphs. And uh, the others are just design choices. So once you know the definition of graph, then a graph net is simply a set of functions that propagates information back and forth between the nodes, the bounds, and uh, the, the graph as a whole, or master node, so to speak. So the three functions on the left are update functions. The three functions on the right are aggregate functions. So update functions update uh, the sort of entity uh, in each time step. So for example, uh, phi e is the update function of edge. Phi v is the update function of vertices or, or nodes. And phi u is the update function of the master node. So phi e takes ek itself, vrk, vsk, which is the, well, the notation is uh, sender and receiver, but since we don't have a, a directed graph, so these two should be interchangeable. It takes the two vertices that it is connecting and the master node and update itself. So vertices, the, the update function of vertices is taking the sort of aggregated uh, edge and the, the hidden state of the vertex, of vertex itself and the master node and aggregate. And it's pretty much the same thing with uh, the global app, update function. So the aggregate functions is basically saying, well, you have a, a sort of, you have a set of entities and you use a sort of smashing function to push it to a summary of the entity. So one um, character of this, one necessary character of these functions is that it takes a set of elements of certain dimension and returns something of that dimension. Either. So we can also include hyperedges. So hyperedges, for example, inspired by uh, uh, MD calculations, you can have this uh, hyperedge that connects three atoms, which is an angle, or four atoms, which is a dihedral angle. And you update and aggregate in a similar fashion. And another very interesting thing to do is pairwise read out. Uh, you can model the interaction between two arbitrary nodes by using sort of uh, this attention mechanism. So an attention mechanism, well, it, it, this seems complicated, but uh, it's really just a linear transformation on your input, another linear transformation on input, uh, you transpose it, and 
then you do a matrix multiplication uh, on these two. So each element is sort of able to, to attend each other or to see each other and interact with each other. So uh, Google is using this sort of model in their translation uh, apps. And uh, there's a funny fact that, there's a fun fact that it's super expensive to train and it costs a lot of uh, CO2 emission. Well, if you, if, you, if you take a look at this, you will realize that attention mechanism is, uh, is permutation equivariant, meaning that if you do a permutation on your input, then, well, then there's sort of weird permutation on the large matrix that you will end up getting. And for a translation model, because you smash the large matrix back onto a, a simple uh, 1D vector, then uh, the, the input and output end-to-end -end should be equivariant. So we can use this little property to test whether Google is actually using attention mechanism itself. Because, well, it is uh, permutation equivariant. So if you, if you select a uh, word that is symmetrical in any given language and you translate it using Google's translation app, then whatever the word you are getting from the other language should also be symmetrical. But is that so? So it tested, if you, if you just find whatever uh, Latin language, if you translate the word bling bling, which is a symmetrical word, uh, then any sort of Latin language, Spanish, French, and Italian, uh, it's, it's the same. If you go to Korean, it's symmetrical. If you go to, uh, this is Russian, it is, Still symmetrical. Uh, the same, same thing with Japanese. Uh, this is four syllables. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows how to speak Japanese, but, but if you go to Chinese, then this is not symmetrical. So the hypothesis is proven to be incorrect, and they are not only using trans, uh, attention mechanism, although they claim attention is I need apparently, uh, which is not I need. All right, so uh, moving back to hypergraph. So, actually, quick question. Yeah, uh, sure. I have to go back to the previous slide. Um, is that a paper? That the, the hypothesis of Google? No, it's just a it's an experiment that I did. I mean, then it's not really Google claiming anything, right? Oh, attention is all you need is the title of the paper. That Google released. That Google released. Oh, OK, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Okay. Let's skip this bit. Uh, so the beauty of GraphNet is that a graph here plays a double role. It is both the, the problem you're trying to solve as well as the space on which you're solving this problem. We'll talk about this a little bit later. So uh, the most interesting or most common usage of GraphNet is to model a, a social network. Let's say you have a, a little gang of three people, three friends here, and you want to mo model their interactions. So the graph notation should be the set of all the vertices, the set of all the edges, and a, a global attribute that belongs to the graph as a whole. So the first step is to update the uh, edges, because normally in the uh, social network, so to speak, the, the uh, relationships between people or the friendship or bond between people is defined by those two people. You do not have a relationship first and then have two individuals as a result of that. So edges are updated by itself because this is a, a, a time dependent model. By the edge itself, by two vertices connected and the global attribute. And the second step is to aggregate all the edges that's connected to a node and update the node based on that, based on the, uh, the node itself at last time step, as well as the global attribute. And finally, you aggregate everything and update the uh, global attribute. So this is uh, what it is if you want to uh, express that in the uh, pseudocode. And we have an uh, implementation of this in uh, this link. So speaking of uh, the package, just uh, one minute of 
You can go back. Um, my profnet's concept is pretty poor, but if you go to the uh, the pseudocode, yep. could you maybe explain the same thing in the pseudocode? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. So uh, for all the edges, you update them by the edge itself, by its connected uh, nodes and the global attribute, right? And in this case, the global attribute is like a global loss. No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, global attribute you, you put on the, the graph as okay. well. For example, it, it could be, uh, or if you're modeling a group of people, you can model, for example, if this is a team of worker, their efficiency as a attribute. You put so it's a proxy, okay. Yeah, it could be a proxy. It could also be a sort of hidden variable or hidden state. Okay. It could be not explicit, it's fine. How are you representing that global attribute? As a vector? As a vector. Okay. Yeah. Is it like a one hot encoder? Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, so, oh, by the way, you can do this in the synchronous or asynchronous manner. <coughs> you really do that in a synchronous manner. The reason is that, well, uh, it, it's faster, it's cheaper, you use a lot of GPU. And also, if you do that in an asynchronous manner, you just determine the order in which they're executed, and you might break the uh, uh, invariance. So a uh, little commercial time for the package that we are uh, developing. It's called Gamma. Uh, so it, it's graph inference on molecular topology. Everything is written uh, in Python and TensorFlow. It's, it's open source. It's under MIT license. And uh, we even have our own input and output pipeline for small molecules. So if you don't like RDKit or something like that, you can use a TensorFlow implementation of all, all those pipelines, and it could just be put onto GPUs or power machine, whatever, uh, all sorts of supercomputers, and compiled and executed in parallel uh, in TensorFlow graphs. Uh, just by the way, the, the most aspect of this project that I'm pr most proud of is the design of the, uh, the, the, the logo. So the first bit of the logo it is a G, German, it is a, a graph, but it's also a chemical graph. It is a, uh, what's that called? Uh, propane oxide, uh, rotated 90 degrees, and it is a, a cocktail glass, a glass. It looks like some, something like this. This is a simple mixture of, I think it's, Gin, uh, lime, lime juice, a piece of lime lettuce syrup, and uh, natural flag. All right, I think, uh, yeah, there's just a few more words on this. So, Uralay, the update functions is just the feed forward network and the aggregate function. Sometimes you can use just sum, you can also use max, you can also use average. These all have the, the feature that I just uh, talked about it's a a function that operates on a set of elements and returns something that looks like in terms of dimensionality uh, an element in that set so a few flavors of graph nets this is a full JDM block everything is connected and everything is executed in the uh, manner that I just talked about if you delete it uh, if you delete some some um, connections, you get a message passing your network. And you, if you delete all the connections between the entities and just have uh, the start, the end, and the entity is connected to itself, it is just a recurrent neural network. So that kind of tells us that this thing itself is sort of a recurrent neural network. It is the same weights, uh, the, the matrix multiplication using the same weights is uh, carried out multiple times during one round of uh, message passing. So the, the name of the message passing is, is based on the idea that it's kind of like that your neighboring nodes is writing a, a message to you and you are updated by that message. And here's just a, uh, some paper uh, on message passing neural network, although it is not as sort of uh, expressive as the, the general full block GN. So there are a bunch of papers that discuss the, uh, 
different sites, if you use all sorts of function as your update, as your uh, aggregate and readout function. Oh, by the way, I think I did not introduce what is a readout function. The readout function is just a, the function that you use at the very end after all rounds of message passing. You take the, the trajectory or just one snapshot of your all, all of your entities and you come up with a, a answer. So for example, if you're predicting uh, the uh, efficiency of a group of workers, then after a few message passing rounds that models their interactions, you have all the trajectories and you have a function that um, take all, the, all of that into consideration and tells you, predicts a number. And you use that in your back propagation step and you minimize the losses if you have data. All right, so uh, let's move on to the first part. The, the previous one is uh, part zero. The first part is about uh, discriminative models per graph attributes, because per graph attributes or per monocle attributes is sort of what everybody is predicting in the uh, molecular machine learning setting. So uh, just a quick showcase of the uh, results. So if we use just the traditional full, full block uh, graph nets, with the residual connection in our readout step. It is already doing pretty good. It is on par with, if not better than most of the state-of-the-art models reported in the uh, molecule net uh, paper. However, it, it's not doing as well in the prediction of something like lipophilicity. And we're gonna talk about the, the reason. So just by looking at the distribution of the, these properties, we can see that, well, uh, ESO, which is water solubility, it's uh, the function of the size of your molecule, of course. The freeze-off is some, some sort of uh, solvation free energy. And it could be, when you have an MD calculation, it could be uh, break down into the terms that could be associated to atoms. So it's sort of uh, atom additive, although not exactly so. Whereas lipophilicity, the distribution, has very little correlation with the number of atoms in your system. So uh, and that's the reason why if you use a mean aggregation rather than a sum aggregation in your last step, it gets slightly better because it is strictly not atom additive. So our question become, is there an association between the sum in the hidden space and the sum in the physical space? In other words, if you have a uh, extensive and you have an intensive property, do you need to make adjustment in your architecture? So to answer this question, we prepared two very simple toy tasks. The first one is molecule weight, and the second one is mean atom weight. Those are the simplest thing you can ever predict, right? Mean atom weight, uh, by, by this I mean just the molecule weight divided by the number of uh, atoms. So uh, if you use the sum to predict the sum of atom weights or molecule weight, it, it works perfectly. If you use a mean to, pre to predict the mean of uh, uh, atom weight, it kind of works, but there's a paper discussing, uh, d discussing the, the fact that mean, aggregate, mean aggregation is not as powerful as some aggregation itself and it's hard to chain. However, if you use the, the opposite, it, it's kind of miserable. Uh, so, well, I guess we, I'm gonna talk about this later, but just to give you another extreme example, if you just want to predict the average and uh, sum of atom weight of these set of molecules. It's cyclo, uh, cyclopropane, cyclopentin, cyclohexane, all the way to uh, cyclic uh, N atom ring. So in, in the language of uh, graph theory, this is a cycle graph. The correct answer of the averaged atom weight is all 12 if you have uh, implicit hydrogen. And uh, a correct answer for the monocle weight in this case is 12 n, n is the number of atoms. So this is kind of obvious, right? <clears throat> but if you use a graph net to solve this problem, it, it gets a little trickier. 
at t equals zero, all the nodes in all the molecules in this set is initialized to have the same attributes. If this is not obvious for smaller graphs, if you want to <coughs> include more uh, features for uh, your atom, your local environment of atoms, this is kind of obvious for larger graphs, right? The, 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 the carbon atoms in a larger graph, in large graph and even larger graph are almost identical. And uh, we use this recursion to say that if at t equals t, this set is locally isomorphic, meaning that all of the nodes are the same, all of the edges are the same, or all the molecules in this set, we call this locally isomorphic, and then you do another round of message passing because you're updating your edge based on the edge itself, the connecting nodes, and you're updating the, the nodes based on the nodes itself and the connecting edges, then at t equals t plus one, it is still locally isomorphic. So the question becomes, well, it is locally isomorphic at all time, right? So after no matter how many rounds of message passing, you now want to use the readout function to get an answer. And to simplify the case, uh, if we just take, uh, if we just look at the last frame in this trajectory, then you have a, a set of exactly identical nodes and exactly identical edges. So if you uh, use uh, some function, it's gonna give you different answers. And it's proportional to the size of the system. If you use mean aggregation, then it's gonna give you the same answer. So if you use a sum function to predict the uh, average weight, it's gonna be wrong. If you use the mean function to predict the sum weight, it's gonna be wrong. So this tells us that, well, although of course, in a, in a realistic uh, situation, you can have a neural network that predicts them both and add them together, concatenate them together, whatever. But it, it tells us that if you have a simple structure, then it is important to know whether your identity is uh, intensive or extensive and choose your aggregation function accordingly. So the, this problem also tells us that graph nets, when using a, a mean aggregation is not able to even predict ring size. This is in contradiction with the results of uh, locus that it can do this many things just with a uh, large enough uh, hidden layer and with uh, enough rounds of message passing. But the, the thing is that this is proven on the basis of a labeled graph. If you have a graph that's unlabeled, then it breaks a lot of uh, properties here. But you also want a unlabeled graph because you want it to be permutation invariant and equivariant determined, uh, determined by what kind of property you're predicting. And the easiest way to do that is to use an unlabeled graph or discard the the label at some stage and perform uh, the node and edge aggregation in a synchronous manner. And I'm also going to talk about a little bit of the discriminative model um, per node and per edge attributes. So this is too theoretical, I think. Uh, maybe we're not going to talk about that. All right, so uh, let's talk about the applications first, charge prediction. So charge is a, a very important parameter in the uh, MD calculation because it determines the, the energy and all the forces in your MD calculation at each time step. And charges are usually predetermined at the beginning of MD calculation and fixed during the entire course. But a, a charging method the charging methods that we are using right now is either uh, super expensive methods or they're unreliable, like the uh, empirical methods. So we're thinking, can we use a, a graph net to approximate the uh, results of um, QM-derived charges? And we train the graph net onto a data set. The first one is uh, a 
a set of charges derived from density functional theory calculation. It's accurate, but it is sort of also the function of your conformer. And we take the lowest energy conformer as the charge associated with that molecule. Well, of course, charges are a function of conformer, but usually in the MD calculation <coughs> at the beginning, we would pretend it is not and determine a, a charge for a atom uh, regardless of its, its, its conformations. So to address this problem, we are also generating charges using M and BCC L10 uh, method that is uh, thought to be the Boltzmann averaged charge um, for several lowest energy conformers. Well, uh, just by looking at the, the, the problem, it is kind of intuitive to predict this, just put it on the node and minimize the, the loss and you, you get the charges. But this does not work very well. Because this line of constraint here, it could be zero, it could be positive, and it could be negative. And uh, generic neural networks doesn't like that. Well, if it is positive or negative all the time, you can just have a, a soft max function to constrain it. So the solution is to, to follow a, a paper done by uh, Mike Gilton et al. Uh, and predict the second and first, the uh, first and second order derivatives of the potential energy with regard to atom charges and use that to reconstruct your charges. So here's the idea. If you expand the contribution to the potential energy by the atom charges as a Taylor expansion and only take the, the first few terms. So this actually is how uh, how electronegativity and the harness are defined. So for a long time, th this has been the standard practice where you just measure or we use quantum mechanics calculations to determine the ionization potential and electro affinity data and fit the harness and electronegativity of all, all the atoms and it's proved to be uh, working. So we, we use the same idea and we use this uh, charge equilibrium method proposed by Gilson et al. And form this as a double optimization pr uh, problem. So you first uh, come up with the prediction of the electronegativity and the harness. And once you have that, uh, which, is uh, which is predicted by your neural net, then you also predict the, the charge that would minimize the uh, potential energy. And luckily, this second step is, is, is easily solvable through a Lagrange multiplier. And this solution is analytical, whose Jacobi and Hessian are trivially easy to calculate. So if you put this end to end, you can flow your gradient through, the, uh, through all the layers. And it's working kind of well. So uh, the discrepancy RMSC is around 0.02 which is so, sort of in the range of the uh, disagreement between M and BCC and uh, DFD calculations. So now we ha already have a method that is almost as accurate as A1 BCC, but it's 500 times faster. If you delete some part, so for example, if you, pre if you do not do the bond other thing, then it's kind of the same, right? But if you uh, directly predict the charge, it's miserable because of the, uh, the constraint that I just mentioned. If you also take a look at the predicted harness and electronegativity of all the elements, the distribution uh, in each element kind of uh, correspond to our understanding of that element. For example, carbon is here. It's very hard and uh, kind of uh, electron neutral. Hydrogen is everywhere. Uh, the halogens are more on the electro uh, negative side and phosphors and uh, 
nitrogen is more on the uh, electropositive side. Uh, so the, this animation is to show what is the uh, latent space look like at each round of message passing, color coded by a different type of elements, by uh, hybridization and by predicted harness and uh, electronegativity. So when t equals zero, we initialize this message passing. You only have a little few dots. I apologize for the, this is not very clear here. You only have a little few dots because of it's only the, what do you know when you initialize the message passing, the element type itself and nothing else. When you do one step of element passing, you know your neighbors, but your direct neighbors. So it's it's scattering, and the more you take, uh, it, it's further spread out. And the things that in the latent space it can already distinguish uh, the different hybridization types, although it did not feed it to the structure directly. They can determine whether it's aromatic or not, and uh, you can see that it's, it's pushing the uh, atoms with different predicted answers to different corners of the latent space. How many kind of steps do you have? Uh, this is five time steps. This is one of the parameters that we need to tune. And usually, anything larger than the six doesn't make a difference. Because you can think of charges as uh, locally determined by the neighbors. And once you go past six, uh, it's, it's not making a difference. Interestingly, if you say like at time step one, it already figures out its neighbors, that's actually pretty good in itself. Like you don't need more than even like two time steps, even just looking at that. Right, because, right? Yeah, because the information from neighbors is aggregating to notice of it. Actually, another question that I curious on is the, the structure, mm -hmm. how deep um, and what sort of hyperparameters you have. Um, because it seems like you have like a, a, I mean, I don't know how overfitting looks like in this space, but mm -hmm. it seems like it's a very complex model with probably too many parameters. Well, the, uh, the structure of the architecture itself is, is kind of complex. Right. But for each function, each composing function, it's only like 32, 64 uh, yeah. dimension, it's already, it's already sufficient. Right, but the connections itself, though, if you have more connections than the training set, then you're always going to overfit. Right, but, but we tested it, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's not prone to overfit. No, I was just curious about the architecture. Right, what right. It looks yeah. like. Well, if, if you look at it, just the pure number of parameters, how many numbers we have in your uh, model, it's not terrible compared to like a traditional a CNN uh, model. Okay, so uh, this graph is showing the linear regression of uh, your next step based on your uh, previous step, which is to say how predictable the next step is. When t equals zero, you don't know, right? You don't know anything, but when, when you have like more knowledge, the knowledge gain you have by allowing a, a further neighbor to uh, pass its message onto you, the, the gain is marginal. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, regarding this model is the scalability. So uh, I was making a bet with Josh about the scalability of this model because it thinks that this is the lo locality is determined by the uh, just number of rounds of message passing and so on and so on. So maybe it will scale poorly with, uh, with regard to the size of the system. So we were hoping that the absolute error will be something like a not very steep increasing trend. But to our surprise, it's actually decreasing. We're still uh, looking into that. So this red zigzag is just a very ugly version of violin plot. And uh, the reason we think that it is decreasing might be a bias in our data set. Because when you do your uh, DFT calculation, if you have more aromatic uh, rings in your molecule, then it could be more accurate. And um, if you have more rings, it tends to be heavier.
All right, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the work in progress, and uh, that's it. So the one thing that we're doing right now is the inter-hierarchical multitask learning. So this is kind of something new. We want to look at how this model is predicting the uh, physical properties. Is there any sort of correspondence or agreement with how physics uh, is, is to, how the properties themselves are determined. So we try to look at, can we do per atom, per bond, and per molecule uh, prediction all at once? Can we, is there any improvement in, in terms of the performance compared to training them independently? Is better or worse? Or can we provide some of these attributes and let a model predict others? Can we provide, for example, these two and predict that? Can we provide these two? Can do all sorts of combinations. So the per atom attributes we have in mind is just charges and uh, harness. Well, I, I don't know. Ch charge is a pretty solid first step. And for per bond attributes, uh, Haya is working on the prediction of uh, Weber bond, bond order, which is a a bond order that is not uh, discretized into numbers. So, so it is a, it's this flow number, but also corresponds to the understanding um, of, uh, of the bond structure by chemist. So you could have like, rather than just one, 1 1.5 and two, you can have any number in between. And this could be determined by quantum chemistry. And it is a pretty good indicator of the energy to break that bond. So we are interested in predicting that uh, as well. So uh, a good thing is that you can de uh, to, to derive all of these in a one in one calculation, in one A and one B to C calculation. You can determine the, the formation energy or the atomization energy of the molecule. You can predict. You can get those two, and uh, we are now generating a a uh, molecule data set of roughly. 3.5 million molecules from enemy that we're going to aggressively uh, do this prediction on. And we're also thinking that maybe we should just release this data set as well. A uh, name that's pending could be a molecule, uh, no, charge net or, or something, so that the machine learning community could use all sorts of uh, architectures to do this inter hierarchical learning. Because right now, uh, most of the models only focus on uh, per molecule attributes. And another very interesting thing that uh, we're trying to do as a team is to use this model directly to predict the parameters of force fields, or rather to, to come up with the machine learning potential that is easy to sample, but pretty much as accurate. So here's the idea. Well, so first of all, if you're familiar with any or Anakin, which is a neural net that use a, that, that takes the, the entire coordinates of your components of a system into a large neural network and it spit out the energy. And it's, it's doing pretty well. It can uh, predict QM energy as well as other priorities with high agreement. But the only thing is that it is 15,000 or 1,500 times slower than the MD calculation. And you cannot use that to produce any trajectories longer than nanoseconds. Uh, because you, uh, you need to do the forward and backward passing once in each time step of your MD calculation, which makes it kind of miserable. But it's very accurate. So we're thinking, can we preserve the uh, traditional separation of bond angle torsion and non-bonded terms, but use a machine learning, uh, something like RoughNet, to determine all the parameters. So this is just a, a traditional uh, MM force field. And there are good things and bad things about it. The good thing is that the, the uh, separation itself is good. The harmonic uh, functional form is good. Uh, this kind of corresponds to the uh, physical understanding of the molecules and the proteins. But all the parameters are bad, are evil, because you need a lot of time to fit it. I guess the entire uh, vision of uh, open force field, well, part of the vision of open force field consortium is to come up with better ways and clever ways 
to fill in all, all these parameters. And there are also this uh, 12th order term that's necessary to evil because it does not have any physical meaning. So we are thinking, can we preserve the, the good equation here and the, the separation, but predict the uh, bound angle towards an pairwise energy as a, a, a polynomial function of which the parameters are filled in by a graph net. So uh, this is where the, the hyper edge coming to play. The, uh, the parameters you put on the vertices, the edges, the angles and dihedrals comes directly from the readout function in your graph net. And uh, well, for example, if you have a if you have a six or twelve or whatever, how many other polynomial you use a graph net to uh, get a number for each term in that polynomial, and you calculate the, the, the energy, and you compare that with the data we have in QC archive, and you can do not only energy but also Jacobians and Hessians, and this is something that uh, we're still working on. Uh, and, and of course, last thing is that even if you do not have this higher order um, polynomials, if you just have two and it is harmonic that's centered on some equilibrium value, then what you get is exactly a, a force field, but just with sort of more clever atom typing. Each atom in a system has its own type. Um, and of course, when design those polynomials, you can you can fill in whatever understanding of uh, this this physical force into the structure of the polynomial. For example, we know that non-monotone terms should be uh, zero at infinity. We know that uh, the bounded terms should be sort of harmonic uh, with regard to uh, when it's near the uh, the equilibrium value. All of these could be easily encoded in the uh, the, the functional uh, forms. And of course, we know that the torsion and angle should be periodic. So maybe you just put a cosine or sine function uh, on the theta before before feed that into uh, the polynomial. And uh, that's pretty much it. And I do appreciate the, the support from Josh and Haya and John. They're uh, fantastic. And my, my friend from Uli Statistical Learning and uh, funding sources and great HPC uh, infrastructure from MSK. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Any questions? Yeah, um, yep. can you go to the slide back again? This is which one? Once at the slide before that. Oh, okay. Yep. So, uh, which data set would you use uh, to derive those? Um, QC Archive. Okay. So QC Archive is, uh, is a uh, effort by Open Force Consortium and uh, Mosi uh, that do, uh, does a, a lot of QM calculation uh, using different levels of quantum chemistry on um, a, a representative collection of small molecules mm. that they believe uh, is useful for deriving force field parameters. Okay. So uh, they uh, are the data set also uh, per parameters? Oh, no. The, 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 so the data set is just quantum mechanic energies and it's Jacobians or, or forces and mm. Hessians. Mm. And luckily, uh, you, can, you can calculate the first and second other derivative of all of these, right, from mm. a neural network. And you just match. You just can, you can do force matching. And you can also try to match the energy. But there is a, a small issue that there are offsets in your, uh, in your QM energy. So it is offset by a little. And you cannot express the, the entire QM energy just using the force of terms. And the uh, strategy we have to, to counter that is to predict the offset as well using a graph net, using another graph net. It could be the same, mm -hmm. just a multitask. But you predict the offset as a function 
of the topology only and not the geometry. So now you can have a, a equilibrium term, so to speak, or, or offset or, uh, ge or geometry independent term, plus all these geometry dependent terms. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is if we just all use second order derivatives here, then it's a clever atom typing plus a, a uh, traditional force field. And even if you have higher order, uh, higher order polynomials, it's trivially easy to just plug those numbers in a platform like OpenMM. Right? You, you, can custom, you can customize your, your uh, bounded and non-bounded force by using a string to represent the energy of the force and then just simulate that. And the, the speed, we did not do experiment yet because we're still fitting all those parameters. But we reckon that the speed will be roughly the same because the most expensive part is to determine the energies, the, uh, the, to, to determine the distances, the angles and torsions. And the, the actual calculation of the energy by using just the polynomial is not as expensive. So you can imagine that it will be a little bit slower than uh, traditional MD and a little bit uh, inaccurate than any but you have this happy middle ground and you can actually use this to, to, to assimilate things and uh, hope them to be in agreement with quantum chemistry. Yes, please. Um, this is me being ignorant of the topic and uh, all of that. So the batch size is a crucial, I mean, in some of the, some of the work that we've done in the past. Components. So, I mean, I know you spoke about like asynchronous, synchronous, mm -hmm. you know, updates, what have you. So, you have a lot of problems, obviously. I don't even know whether I couldn't want to ask you mm -hmm. how much batch size actually, you know, does to the model overall and your results. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can touch base on any of that. Well, so, uh, graph size is just another hyperparameter that we tune during the uh, very aggressive hyperparameter tuning. And, but it is very important how we batch those things. Because, well, molecules, they have different number of atoms. And if you just pad them to the largest, at, uh, largest molecule in your data set, then you're gonna waste a lot of that dummy atoms. And uh, so this is sort of an active research field. Uh, our solution is to diagonally concat the adjacency map of different molecules onto a larger uh, graph and just pat to pat to, to the pat to the rest. So, for example, if if you say I, I want to have a batch size of one twenty eight atoms, then you get a ten, get an eight, get a ten, get an eight, or whatever how how different your size may be. And when you reach a point where if you grab another molecule from your data set, this is going to be more than 128, then you pad to 128. And so by this means, you, you only waste uh, the few uh, dummy atoms. And it is a, a efficient strategy. It's proven to be efficient, a efficient strategy compared to, well, you can also ban it, for example. We can have one net, net that deals with the, uh, the molecules uh, with fewer than 10 atoms and one with 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 and so on and so forth and just allow all those network to share parameters. And this will be like 20 times uh, longer in terms of training and inference with regard to just pad them and uh, treat them as a larger graph. Right, but the application effect is that once you have a trained model, you mm -hmm. can infer in vertical time. I don't know if you've done that benchmarking as well, like, you know, like on a test set, what your inference time is, for example, or yeah, yeah, in this case. I think I did it. It's, it's 0. 0.0002 seconds. So that's pretty quick. Yeah. And, uh, but I think one way I would, I don't know if you've already mm -hmm. probably looked at it, but it's like you, you pad for a given number, right? The difference of what you want to accommodate mm -hmm. in your batch size. Have you played around with increasing the padding, decreasing the padding, and seeing yep, if yep. you can see if there's more efficient ways to do it? Uh, there's a difference in efficiency, of course, 
but there is also uh, this problem how stochastic is your stochastic gradient descent is yeah. right so it's bad says also affects the last trajectory yeah well, we, just, we played with this and just included as a as a hyperparameter and did some search I guess this is the only way we can do that because yeah it's so black boxy right how about bash normalization no, we did not do that. Add in, okay, I mean, just making sure because I think the batch size plays a crucial role right, uh -huh. when you have batch normalization uh -huh. enabled. Um, but that batch normalization helps you get to your um, overall it accuracy a lot time. quicker. Right. So maybe that's one of the things you can look yeah, into. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you should try that. Because you're talking about like, you know, the time and all that it takes. Mm -hmm. all that, so. Any questions from people from Zoom? I guess no. Okay. In this case, thank you so much. Thank you.